Hello and welcome back to Poetry Corner. We're looking at a poem this morning which is uh, very appropriate for the season of remembrance. I'm recording this just a bit before Remembrance Sunday. It's a poem by G.A. Studdart Kennedy, Geoffrey Anskell Studdart Kennedy, uh, better known often by his nickname amongst the troops of Woodbine Willie. He was a chaplain with the soldiers in the First World War and was famous for giving out Woodbine cigarettes to them in the days when the health consequences of smoking were not so well known. Kennedy was a, a chaplain, a Church of England minister uh, assigned to the troops through the First World War. And he wrote a long series of poems uh, wrestling with his experience of war and with his faith in the light of the horrors that he saw and underwent. Uh, I'm very fond of this poem. It's not the easiest of poems to read or engage with, partly because of what it's talking about and partly because it should really be read in a Cockney accent. I'm not going to uh, attempt that one, but uh, I'll do my best to read it. I have to say there's a few places where I think Kennedy is a little bit wrong theologically, and I will talk about those afterwards. Um, but I think the poem still has an awful lot to teach us, not just intellectually, but emotionally, in terms of how we understand a God of love ruling over a world of suffering. So without further ado, let's listen to Studdart Kennedy's poem, The Sorrow of God. Yes, I used to believe in Jesus Christ, and I used to go to church. But since I left home and came to France, I've been knocked clean off my perch. For it seemed all right at home, it did, to believe in a God above, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, what died on the cross through love. When I went for a walk of a Sunday morn on a nice fine day in the spring, I could see the proof of the living God in every living thing. For how could the grass and the trees grow up all alone of their blooming selves? You might as well believe in fairy tales and think they were made by elves. So I thought that that long-haired atheist was naught but a silly sod, for how did he account for my Brussels sprouts if he didn't believe in God? But it ain't the same out here, you know. It's as different as chalk and cheese, for half of it's blood and the other half mud. And I'm darned if I really see how the God who has made such a cruel, cruel world can have love in his heart for men and be deaf to the cries of the men as dies and never come home again. Just look at that little boy corporal there, such a fine upstanding lad, with a will of his own and a way of his own and a smile of his own he had. An hour ago he was bursting with life, with his acting and fooling and fun. He was simply the life of us all he was. Now look what the blighters have done. Look at him lying there all of a heap with the blood soaking over his head like a beautiful picture spoiled by a fool, a bundle of nothing, dead. On the loving God he looks down on it all, on the blood and the mud and the smell. O oh God, if it's true, how I pity you, for you must be living in hell. You must be living in hell all day and living in hell all night. I'd rather be dead with a hole in my head. I would by a darn long sight than be living with you on your heavenly throne, looking down on yon bloody heap that was once a boy full of life and joy, and hearing his mother weep. The sorrows of God must be hard to bear, if he really has love in his heart, and the hardest part in the world to play must surely be God's part. And I wonder if that's what it really means, that figure who hangs on the cross. I remember I saw one the other day as I stood with the captain's horse. I remember, I think, I think so to myself, it's a long time since he died. Yet the world don't seem much better today than when he was crucified. It's always the same as it seems to me. The weakest must go to the war. And whether it's right or whether it's wrong don't seem to matter at all. The better you are and the harder it is, the harder you have to fight. It's a cruel hard world for any bloke what does the thing which is right. And that's how he came to be crucified, for that's what he tried to do. He were always a trying to do his best for the likes of me and you. Well, what if he came to the earth today, came walking about in this trench? How his heart would bleed for the sights he'd see in the mud and the blood and the stench. 
and I guess it would finish him up for good when he came to this old sap end and he saw that bundle of nothing there, for he wept at the grave of a friend. And they say he was just the image of God. I wonder if God sheds tears. I wonder if God can be sorrowing still, and has been all these years. I wonder if that's what it really means. Not only that he once died, not only that he came once to earth and wept and was crucified, not only that he suffered once for all to save us from our sins, and then went up to his throne on high to wait till his heaven begins. But what if he came to earth to show by the paths of the pain he trod, that blistering flame of eternal shame that burns in the heart of God? But why don't you bust this show to bits and force us to do your will? Why ever should God be suffering so and man be sinning still? Why don't you make your voice run out and drown these cursed guns? Why don't you stand with an outstretched hand out there betwixt us and the Huns? Why don't you force us to end this war and fix up a lasting peace? Why don't you will that the world be still and wars forever cease? That's what I'd do if I were you, and I had a lot of sons who squabbled and fought and spoiled their home. Same as us boys and the Huns. And yet, I remember a lad of mine. He's fighting now on the sea. And he was a thorn in his mother's side and the plague of my life to me. Lord, how I used to switch that lad till he fairly yelped with pain. But fast as I thrashed one devil out, another popped in again. And at last he grew up a strapping lad and he ups and says to me, My will is my own and my life is my own. And I'm going, Dad, to see. And he went, for I hadn't broken his will, though God knows how I tried. And he never set eyes on my face again till the day his mother dies. Well, maybe that's how it is with God. His sons have got to be free. Their wills are their own, their lives are their own, and that's how it has to be. So the Father God goes sorrowing still for his world which has gone to sea. But he runs up a light on Calvary's height that beckons to you and me. The beacon light of the sorrow of God has been shining down the years, flashing its light through the darkest night of our human blood and tears. There's a sight of things which I thought were strange, as I'm just beginning to see. Inasmuch as you did it unto one of these, you did it unto me. So it isn't just only the crown of thorns that has pierced and torn God's head. He knows the feel of the bullet too, and he's had his touch of lead. And he's standing with me in this here sap, and the corporal stands with him. And the eyes of the laddie is shining bright, but the eyes of the Christ burn dim. Oh laddie, I thought as you'd done for me, and broken my heart with your pain. I thought you'd taught me that God was dead, but you've brought him to life again. And you've taught me more of what God is than ever I thought to know, for I never thought he could come so close, or that I could love him so. For the voice of the Lord, as I hear it now, is the voice of my pals that bled, and the call of my country's God to me is the call of my country's dead. Well, as I said, it's a powerful poem, not the easiest of poems to engage with. Let me walk us through it, and then I'll give us some reflections upon it. The poem, of course, is in the voice of a soldier caught in the horror of France, who was unquestioningly, unthinkingly Christian before he became a soldier, found it easy to believe in God when everything was going well, and found himself questioning how the world could be made and ruled by a God of love in the face of the horrors he saw of the war. A common experience, I think, for many, whether it's war that shakes their faith or personal bereavement or any of the other nasty things we come across in this world. But the poet's story, the, the speaker's, the narrator's journey, doesn't stop there. Because he keeps reflecting and says, well, hang on a minute. If there is a loving God looking down on all this, if he sees and knows everything that happens on earth, then he sees all the horror, all the sorrow, sorrow, 
all the suffering brought about by human sin and rebellion. He sees the dead soldier and he sees and hears the weeping of the soldier's mother. He sees the pain of the parent whose children are starving to death in Africa, the pain of the young woman trafficked um, internationally, the pain of those dying of COVID-19. He sees it all. He feels it all. The sorrows of God must be hard to bear if he really has love in his heart, and the hardest part in the world to play must surely be God's part. And so the poet reflects on the cross and says maybe the cross is not just the historic suffering of Jesus 2,000 years ago, but also a reminder of the suffering of God for thousands of years as he looks down on the human beings that he loves, fighting, dying, starving, sickening in a world that is poisoned by sin and by evil. And as he reflects on this, um, the poet starts to ask, well, if that's so, if that's how hard it is to be God, to sit and look down on all this suffering of those you love, why don't you intervene? Why don't you bust this show to bits and force us to do your will? Why don't you just make your kingdom come and make everyone do right? And yet as he thinks on that, he reflects on a son of his own and how the son had to have his own free will and make his own choices, even when those hurt him as, as his son's father, um, culminating in his son going off to sea against his wishes. And he says, well, maybe it's like that with God. If he's going to give us free will, he has to give us free will. If he's going to let us choose our own way, he has to let us choose the wrong way. And so the Father God goes sorrowing still for his world which has gone to sea. But he runs up a light on Calvary's height that beckons to you and me. The beacon light of the sorrow of God has been shining down the years, flashing its light through the darkest night of our human blood and tears. Maybe he says, maybe God is there suffering with us and waiting for us to come back to him, waiting for us to turn away from the mess we have made. And the lighthouse that shines through the darkness of human experience is Calvary, because it shows that God suffers, that God shares in our pain and cares for it, and wants something better for us. So the poem ends with the poet reflecting that um, he thought that the presence of suffering would turn him away from God, would teach him that God was dead, because how could a God of love allow a world of suffering? But as he reflected on it, and particularly the death of this young corporal, he realised that the truth is much higher and greater than that. That a God who gives his people, his children, free will must allow them to suffer, must allow them to choose wrong, uh, wrong paths that have consequences. If our choices and our freedoms are to be real, then the consequences of them must be as well. So if God is going to give us the dignity of being Beings with choice, beings with free will, beings that are more than programmed robots, if he's to give us the dignity of significance, he has to give us real choices with real consequences, even when that means we suffer and therefore he suffers. Because however much human beings suffer in this world, a God of love is going to suffer more if he sees it and shares in it and feels for it. And so his contemplation of suffering leaves him feeling far closer to God and loving God far more because he realises just how much God has suffered for his children, not just in dying once on the cross for them, but in allowing them to break his heart by the choices they make and yet still looking over them, refusing to stop loving them, refusing to harden his heart against us, but continuing to let it be broken anew every day by the way we live and the things we do, because he refuses to give up on his children. It's a very powerful message, and I think it, it gives us a different perspective on the suffering in life. I must say, I think it underestimates how far God is active and is at work. He's not just a passive suffering spectator, but is at work 
effort to change and transform the world. He comments that things don't seem much better today than when Christ was crucified. And you can see why he felt that, but as a historian, things are an awful lot better than they were 2,000 years ago. But they still have a very long way to go. The world is still full of suffering. And God allows it because he allows us to have choices with consequences. He allows it because he doesn't want to just call the show to a halt, sweep the board clean and bring about his judgment now when so many people don't yet know him. The Bible says that the reason the world hasn't ended yet is that God is patient, not wanting any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. And so God waits and he endures the pain of watching the children he loves suffer and sin and reject him and turn away from his love and break each other and break his heart. He endures it because he's waiting for as many people as possible to come to repentance. How is that going to happen? How are people going to come to repentance? How is the world going to be changed without God overriding free will? How is it going to be changed in a way that reflects human choices? It respects human responsibility? Well, it's going to happen as people choose to live differently, as they choose to follow God in Christ, as they choose to repent and believe and be forgiven. And the way that's going to happen is as God's church call people to repentance and to faith in Christ. Why is God suffering as he watches the sin and evil of our world? It's because he's waiting for the church to do its job. It's because he's waiting for us to bring the world to know him and to repent and to follow him. Because he's waiting for the human race to choose him. And because he's working for the day when out of our own free will, we will answer his call and follow him. That's perhaps an even more uncomfortable picture than we're accustomed to. It reminds us of God's love for the world and the extent to which the state of the world must grieve that. But it also reminds us of the wonderful dignity he gives us of being those who get a choice in our eternal destiny. And it reminds us of the great responsibility of the church as the instrument God has chosen to use to call people to make the right choice, to call people to repent and believe. I hope that can be a comfort and a challenge to us as we come to this Remembrance Sunday. God be with you. <laughs>